I'm Paul Levinson, and welcome to Light On, Light Through, episode 113. Well, for better or worse, as I either promised or threatened, depending upon your point of view, I am indeed picking up the pace of the episodes of Light On, Light Through. And today I'm going to review Making a Murderer, both seasons. I watched the first season back in December 2015, and my wife and I just finished binge-watching the second season uh, in the past few days, which would mean the third week or so of October 2018. And actually, I had intended to do a podcast after I saw the first season. I did write a blog post about it, as I did about the second season. And in the show notes, I'll give you the links to those blog posts. But I thought I'd also do a podcast. It's a really, really important subject. And in fact, the full title of this podcast episode is Making a Murderer, a Frightening Reflection on American Justice. And I'm going to begin by reading my review of the first episode and then on to the second episode. Well, I began my review of that December 2015 10-episode documentary by noting that there are monsters in making a murderer, but likely not Stephen Avery and definitely not his nephew, Brendan Dassey, both sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of Teresa Hallback 10 years ago, that is in 2005. No, the indisputable monsters in this true story, in my opinion, are the police, prosecutors, and Dassey's first defense attorney. Also indisputable is that Avery was not guilty of a rape and assault committed in 1985, for which he served 18 years in prison, nearly half of them after the real criminal confessed because said confession was shelved by the detective who could have acted upon it. And Avery was released for this crime only after the discovery of DNA, which was the rapist, not Stephen Avery. Much of the ten hours of this first season of Making a Murderer are the trials of Avery and his nephew for the 2005 murder, and the various appearances in court, before and after the trials. These courtroom scenes in themselves make making a murder like no other documentary you've ever seen, and one especially and ideally suited to streaming on Netflix. As you watch hour after hour of this wrenching horror story unfold, you feel for all the world as if you are actually in those courtrooms, in that jury box, watching the proceedings unfold. And I should mention that I served as foreperson on a jury on a much lesser criminal trial a few years ago, and watching Making a Murderer brought all of that back. And I wrote a blog post about that experience, and I'll likely do a podcast about that as well. But back to making a murderer. The interviews, especially with Avery's attorneys and family, are also indelible and powerful. Brendan Dassey was convicted on no evidence other than a confession obtained by police who fed him the elements of the confession and by a ratification of that confession by his first defense attorney's investigator, who, for some reason, he and the attorney wanted their client to confess to Hallback's murder. The amazing and sickening thing about both of these confessions and the role of the detectives and the defense attorney's investigator is that the interrogations of Dassey, then 16 years old and with limited intellectual capacity, 
were fully recorded on video. But more sickening and horrifying than that was the fact that the jury and judge in the original trial and subsequent judges who reviewed the case and trial saw those very same videos, as did we, the audience of this remarkable documentary. The decisions of those jurors and judges on the basis of what we have seen with our own eyes is about the worst indictment of our legal system here in America I've ever seen. Avery's situation is a little more complicated. He never confessed. He was convicted for the murder on the basis of evidence, such as blood found in the victim's car. An FBI agent testified that a test proved the blood was fresh. That is not taken from a vial of Avery's blood stored from the 1985 case. A forensic expert called by the defense testified that the FBI agent had not accurately reported the limits of the test. In particular, that the lack of an EDTA finding in the test did not prove that EDTA was not present in the blood. Yep, that's the way many of these tests work. A positive finding means the chemical was present, but a negative finding does not mean it was not. The forensic expert explained this very clearly. More than enough for reasonable doubt and a not guilty verdict, right? Well, you might think so, but not in this trial. Though it was later revealed that seven of the 12 jurors in the Avery case initially wanted a not guilty verdict and somehow were inexplicably talked out of it. Winston Churchill is famous for saying that democracy is the least worst form of government and making a murderer provides a vivid piece of evidence that the same could be said about our judicial system. Video evidence, seeing something with your own eyes, was apparently not enough in Dassey's case. But then again, it hasn't been enough in the cases of cop after cop in the past few years shown right there on video shooting or otherwise killing an innocent African American. Not enough for grand juries to indict, or if they do indict, for most juries to return a guilty verdict. And let me just add this note in 2018 that is, thankfully, beginning to change. That is, cops who murder African Americans right there on camera are finally beginning to be brought to justice. But back to making a murderer. The common awful denominator of that story and all those Black Lives Matter cases in which the obvious guilty party walked away scot-free is the undue respect so many Americans have. That is the undue respect so many Americans have for our police and prosecutorial systems. One can only hope, as more people see this extraordinary documentary, that they will begin to see the truth behind the curtain. Thank you, filmmakers Mara Demos and Laura Riccardi and Netflix for bringing this to our attention. And now I will read to you, with probably certain additions and perhaps little deletions, my review of Making a Murderer 2 which I just saw, as I told you, last week. I call this the very pits of justice. My wife and I binge-watched the second season of Making a Murderer on Netflix. In an America brought to new levels of injustice and anger and despair, courtesy of Donald Trump, and commitment to vote him and his Republicans out of office as soon as possible. The story of what happened to Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey provides yet another totally separate example of the decline and miscarriage of justice in America. In this case, due again to police, prosecutors, and judges, including the U.S. Supreme Court. The facts are these. 
Brendan Dassey confessed when he was 16 years old to murdering Teresa Halbach. There is no forensic evidence whatsoever to implicate him in the crime, yet he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. The video in which he gave his confession couldn't be more clear. He is not very bright, and he's fed imagined details of the crime by his questioners, who were police detectives. They told him what they needed to hear, over and over again, until he was able to mouth the words of his confession. All of that is laid out in sickening detail. That is sickening for American justice and what it now does in season one. Laura Nyrider and Stephen Drizzen take up Dassey's defense in season two. They get no justice for their client in Wisconsin courts. Their only option is to appeal in federal courts. This has become very difficult given AEDPA, A-E-D-P-A, which stands for Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, which was passed overwhelmingly by Congress into law, and yes, signed into law by Bill Clinton in 1996. This instructs federal judges to be extraordinarily careful in overturning convictions for murder in state courts. Nonetheless, a federal district court judge did that for Dassey. The state of Wisconsin could have released him, but uh, they chose to appeal. A three-judge appellate panel, the Seventh Circuit, U.S. Circuit, upheld the district judge. Again, the state of Wisconsin could have let Dassey go the day or two after. But instead... Wisconsin appealed again, this time to the full Seventh Circuit, which decided four to three that nothing untoward had happened in Dassey's interrogation or his subsequent conviction. Nyrider and Drizzen took the case to the U.S. Supreme Court, where four justices were needed to get the high court to just consider the case. That requisite number could not be attained, and the Supreme Court declined to hear Dassey's case this past June of 2018. The villains in this outrage? Well, there are many, but I'd put at the top of the list for various reasons Wisconsin Attorney General Brad Schimmel. The at least six justices on the U.S. Supreme Court who were uninterested in hearing Dassey's case and Bill Clinton, who should have at least had the integrity to veto AEDPA, even though Congress likely would have overridden that veto. The result? A young man, now in his late 20s, is on his way to spending most of his life in prison based on a confession that one of the judges in the Seventh Circuit said makes her, quote, skin crawl. I suppose if Stephen Avery's conviction is overturned that Brendan Dassey might have another chance. Avery again served 17 years in prison for a rape he didn't commit. DNA evidence finally cleared him before he was arrested and convicted for Teresa Halbach's rape and murder. Avery never confessed. He was convicted on forensic evidence that his new lawyer, Kathleen Zellner, has systematically shown was concocted and planted. The scientific experts she has brought to bear on this case say the following. Blood in the car in which Hallback's body was allegedly thrown has a splatter pattern totally inconsistent with that. Same for blood that allegedly came from Avery. A bullet fragment that allegedly passed through Hallback's skull and brain shows no traces of phosphorus, which would be there if the bullet went through bone. The burn pit on the Avery property 
in which her body was allegedly all but cremated could not have generated the heat necessary for that sort of total consumption in the flames, etc., etc. Zellner has also suggested a variety of alternative suspects, including Brendan's brother Bobby and his stepfather Scott. When the final episode of the second season ends, she has achieved at least the positive result of an appeals court in Wisconsin ordering the lower court to have a new evidentiary hearing on the case. The effect on the Avery family, as well as the Hallback family, has been devastating. Stephen's parents are in their 80s, and everyone worries with due cause that they may pass away before their son is released. Zellner's pointing at Brendan's brother and stepfather as the possible murderers has, of course, set Brendan's mother against Zellner and even her brother Stephen Avery. But such is the state of justice in America in 2018. It doesn't and shouldn't matter if I or anyone is 100% sure that Stephen and Brendan did not do this heinous crime. I am 100% sure that there's more than enough reasonable doubt in dozens of places. Why more judges and justices haven't seen that is cause for concern, not only about our justice system, but about the human condition itself. The Light on Light Through podcast. Well, I hope you found that podcast episode interesting and educational. I'll be back here soon with a podcast episode, uh, probably a little less depressing and aggravated. In the meantime, I'm Paul Levinson. Enjoy. Athens, 2042 A.D. She ripped the paper in half, then ripped the halves, then ripped what was left again into bits and pieces of history that could have been. Sierra Waters had read once that, years ago, it was thought that men made love for the thrill, while women made love for the sense of connection it gave them. Curled up with a good book says, Sierra Waters is sexy as hell. You can find out more about The Plot to Save Socrates by Paul Levinson at theplottosavesocrates.com. <laughs>